Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the OII's next Wednesday webinar, which is the second instalment of the Next Gen series. This week featuring Dr. Matthew Bowie, hosted by Professor Gina Neff, on what is urban data justice? Defining, conceptualizing, and exploring data use, reuse, and refusal for racial justice. A little housekeeping, we are fortunate to have a varied audience with a wide range of views, and we request that the opinions of others are respected in this space. For your awareness, this event is being recorded and will be posted on our website following the event. You can pose any question using the Q&A tab at any time, and these will be answered towards the end of the talk. Please try and keep questions as concise as possible. The questions will be visible to all attendees, and you can upvote and comment upon them um, as you see fit. We will endeavour to follow up on any unanswered queries. Please allow me to introduce Professor Gina Neff. Thank you, everyone. Good evening or good day, wherever you happen to be in the world. I am Gina Neff, and I'm Professor of Technology and Society here at the Oxford Internet Institute. And it is my great privilege to host what promises to be an incredibly interesting discussion. Before we get started, I'd like to tell you about the Oxford Internet Institute's Next Gen Speaker Series. It uses our platform to showcase the next generation of internet studies scholars from around the globe. This lecture series is intended to inform our students, our research community, and our public audiences about new and emerging perspectives on digital technologies and data, focusing particularly on intersectional appro approaches to questions of justice, fairness, and equity in an increasingly technologically mediated society. So it is my great privilege and honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Matthew Bowie. He is a provost, a, a provost postdoctoral fellow at the NYU Alliance for Public Interest Tech and an affiliate with the NYU Center for Critical Race and Digital Studies and the UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry. His research examines the potential for and barriers to urban data justice, particularly considering the racial politics of data-driven technologies, platforms, and policy. The Democracy Fund, Urban Communication Foundation, and the Annenberg Foundation has funded his research, and he also received the 2018 Urban Communication Award, the Benton Junior Scholar Award, and the Aspen Institute's Guest Scholar Award. Prior to receiving his doctorate at the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Southern California, Matt attended here nearby the London School of Economics and UCLA, and he's worked both in urban nonprofit and technology marketing. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Matthew Bowie. Thank you, Gina, and thank you, everybody. Um, I will be sharing my screen, um, and I hope you all can see it. Uh, it's an honor to be welcome. Or it's an honor to be here today. Excited to be sharing. Um, and I think just segueing from Gina's bio, our brief background, um, I want to kind of give an overview of how I approach and think about data justice, urban data justice. How do we really critique and think through? the racial politics, the racial implications of datafication. Um, and to begin with that, I think you heard that I was in urban nonprofit marketing, I was in technology marketing, um, and I returned to grad school at LSE to really think about what does it mean to communicate, um, to use data to tell stories, but to tell stories for good. Um, and so I think underlying this whole presentation is thinking about what is a communicative approach to data, to data studies, to data science, how do we think about the narratives that we do tell with data? How do we think about the narratives that we can tell, uh, but also about data, especially in this moment? And I'll give further background um, as we think about these bigger questions of my research. But underlying all this and underlying the series is thinking about intersectional approaches. So really thinking about equity, justice, fairness. Um, and so as I'm thinking about these stories, as I'm presenting this work, I'm really thinking about the ways in which data can tell narratives that are skewed, are often skewed, because as we think about the social media platforms that we engage with, as we think about uh, broader society and just the unequal relations, how do we actually foreground that? Not all data platforms are neutral, not all databases are neutral or representative. How do we really bring that to the fore and think critically 
um, in, in complex ways, how data can help, but also how it hinders uh, justice at times. Right, so uh, we'll, we won't go into it all, but I'll, I'm thinking in the back of my mind also about these platforms such as Yelp, Nextdoor, Zillow, these very community-based, um, and I don't know if uh, far reach uh, to the UK, but these are very much community-based platforms where they present information data about communities. So I'm thinking really about the community narratives that we tell with data about data. Um, and to begin, uh, just thinking about like the this tale of two smart cities and these two projects. On the left, um, you'll have Sidewalk Labs project. It was run by Alphabet Company in Toronto. Shortly after COVID, um, the Alphabet Company announced that it would be closing down this project. Um, but underpinning a lot of these critiques about this project were a lot of was a lot of activism. So if you know Bianca Wiley um, and her work and others, others, they were really calling into question the ways in which the Alphabet Company, Google, um, wanted to call data about visitors without their knowledge, without their trust, and just to uh, really think about the implications that they weren't as transparent about how they would use the data, about who would be ha who would have access to the, such data. Meanwhile, on the right, uh, I show Boston in the United States, a picture of the Boston Harbor, because thinking about their smart cities, their data-driven analytics, and the background of my, my project, I'm thinking about the ways in which for all the parents in the room, you might resonate with why this is a bad idea, but Boston suggested based on data science, based on data analytics, that elementary middle school children should start school as early as 45 minutes earlier than their previous start times, all in the interest of alleviating traffic. So needless to say, when those recommendations came, um, a lot of Boston residents, a lot of Boston parents pushed back and were questioning the community input, the community knowledge that was, uh, given, granted, to inform such decisions and recommendations. And I say this all to say, um, as we think about data, as we think about communities, I'm really thinking about the smart city imaginary and how it's a corporate driven project, how it's often not a community engaged project, but how do we really critique that? How do we really engage and think about the alternative pathways for justice, for equity, for community engagement through data in communities? Underpinning a lot of that thought, um, these broader questions is also thinking about data ethics, from moving from data ethics to data justice. So um, I don't know if you all have been following, it's been rapidly evolving, but thinking about data, the data ethics field, um, and a lot of critiques have been coming out this past year and the past two years as well, and it's rapidly evolving, but thinking about how data ethics by and large often treats bigger as better, or um, think, thinking about the implications of data-driven narratives that law bigger as better, more data is better. Um, quantum, quantitative modes of thinking and methods, um, perpetuating narratives of data as neutral, as objective, as inherently value added. Yet uh, I began to wrestle with these questions and to think about these implications and to question such thinking um, as, I was more and more exposed to data justice and critical race theory, because there has been a history of just the ways that data has been socially constructed. It's been used to as a political weapon to weaponize against communities of color, um, but also thinking the underlying data sources that we're using as socially shaped. So I alluded to social media platforms and how they're skewed user bases. How do you really think about that skew? How do we really, really think about platforms that's not neutral? Um, but as embodiments of those social inequalities. And then finally, um, data justice, thinking about how do we go from uh, neutrality, objectivity, to think about really grassroots visions of data action and data activism. How is data political? How can it be put to use um, for justice? Finally, um, and I swear we'll get to the two studies that I'm sharing. Um, but underlying the, a lot of this thought is thinking about the critical race theory aspects of data, thinking about this prehistory of urban data and just the ways that urban data has been used for oppression, for experimentation, for prediction. Um, so this is very US based and I acknowledge that limitation and I, I look forward to expanding and thinking about the global implications um, and global context. But within the US context, uh, there's this seminal report, report called the Moynihan Report. And I bring this to attention because it's one of the sources for the black matriarchal hypothesis. Um, it's one of, which is the idea that 
black families have been oppressed are so poor because of their matriarchal structures. And this was critiqued, debunked, um, taken down, but these ideas, these narratives still um, are perpetuated even today. Yet I bring this to attention because Moynihan actually said the data spoke to this, the data said this. And how do we actually critique what the data said? How do we actually think about these histories where data has been weaponized to uphold narratives about people's oppression, um, to justify their oppression rather than to liberate them? Um, and how do we move from there from experimentation, oppression, control, prediction to liberation, accountability, transparency, collective efficacy. And so underlying that thought and thinking about work such as Ida B. Wells, who did a lot of statistics to document lynching in America and to call attention to those issues as a policy issue, or W.E. Du Bois, who was um, a sociolo urban sociologist who was often critiqued for his quote unquote, non-neutral activistic stance or more contemporary modes um, such as data for black lives and other groups, which we'll dovetail into um, in shortly. So uh, underlying, I also want to just preview that underlying this thought and thinking as we think about smart cities, as we think about communities as data, I'm also thinking about redlining in the US context as a data-driven technology. Uh, for those not familiar, uh, redlining just refers to how the US mortgage um, lenders often categorize different communities and base their judgments for lending on these categories. So in this map of Los Angeles, you'll see these red and yellow zones. They often were the, the areas that were not rendered uh, investment or, or not were rendered too, uh, too, too many people of color. They were black and immigrant communities. They were the communities that did not get these mortgage lenders uh, approval. Meanwhile, the blue and green zones were where white people were often residing. Um, they were the ones that were often granted mortgage approvals. And as you can see, and as we'll talk about later, um, as these issues intersect with data and think about how we put data to use, um, this racial landscape um, is really impacted by the data schemas that were driving these decisions. And so I'm thinking about how does redlining have a legacy? How do we address that legacy through data, but also critically, um, carefully engage with um, those legacies as they persist in social media platforms? So all that to say, uh, the bigger question today that I hope we'll dig into through the Q&A through this talk is just, if urban data is the answer, what is the question? Uh, and so to do that, I'll unpack two studies that are in progress um, and then we'll open up for Q&A. All right, so this first study um, is very much qualitative. And then I'll be uh, um, presenting on a second study that builds on that and thinks about computational methods, mixed methods um, to really engage with data for good. But this first study just really thinks about how do we have a community-minded approach? How do we think about how community-based organizations are engaging with data, but also disengaging with data, given these histories that I've highlighted before, given these histories of weaponization, of just being denigrated by data um, and disinvested as a result of data-driven decision-making. And so to do this, um, I'm presenting this uh, slide with a bunch of organizations that I just called through um, different initiatives, different posts that they were in which they talked about data, mainly in the Los Angeles area. Because again, um, I'm trying to think through and we'll dig into later of like the ethnographic approaches to data, data science, how do we be more grounded? And so this project largely started as I was a data science fellow, um, but also just wanting to be on the ground and thinking about how are different organizations in LA thinking about data, as well as those right, the right column is the US national organizations. Data for Black Lives and Mi Gente are also leading organizations in the area of data justice. And so how are they thinking about data? What are they doing with data? What are they not doing with data? How does that change how we think about data science? And so the typology proposes four different categories and we'll go through the results briefly and then we'll get to the second study. Um, but the four categories in this typology of data engagement, data disengagement are use, data use. So this is your standard um, primary data collection. So they're collecting surveys, they're collecting interviews to address gaps of knowledge. Um, they're just really calling the data primary sources of data that they can use. 
Meanwhile, in data reuse, I'm thinking about the use of uh, census data, other open data. Um, and this is where like, I think you'll get the traditional um, data science analytics, right? Like you're repurposing the data, a bunch of data sets to do some form of analytics. Um, the third category of the typology is data refusal. And we'll unpack that more through um, quotes and examples, but thinking about what are applications of data? What are the implications of data that we should resist? that we should uh, have political campaigns against. So for instance, no tech for ICE, um, no tech for the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, um, thinking about how data has been weaponized and being used against communities of color. Um, how do we refuse that? How do we draw attention to that? What should we be refusing? And then finally, data production is just thinking about, uh, I mean, we're in the, a lot of us are academics in the academy, it's just how do we share those results? How do we share data sets? Um, we'll briefly touch about that, but I think it makes sense that in the academy, there's a lot of data production. Um, so I share this graph and just the summary table um, after calling through hundreds and hundreds of posts from the organizations um, total, and then um, kind of doing this typology with a research assistant. This is the summary table of the thematic analysis. Um, I won't go into general trends too much, but I just want to note again, uh, for instance, the LA based organizations often like different LA based organizations are represented in terms of the anti eviction mapping project, color coded stop LAPD spying. Um, meanwhile, we have the second group. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the LA based university affiliates. So oftentimes these groups were um, not refusing data per se or not outrightly political. Um, yet they were always producing some form of research report, um, sharing data. I think that makes sense. Um, and then finally, the national organizations, they were doing their things in separate ways. And I say all this to say, um, I'm not really comparing these organizations, but trying to see the broad spectrum of reactions, the range of um, responses to data. And then I think the qualitative, the more in-depth analysis and quotes um, will elucidate this and bring it uh, sh show the implications further. For instance, um, the group that is called Data Black for Black Lives, their founder, Yoshi Milner, wrote about, we will not allow the weaponization of COVID-19 data. And so this quote on the right, you see just the ways in which they see data use and reuse um, to, not, to address knowledge gaps as a form of uh, activism, as a form of accountability. Um, to collect data, to repurpose data, to analyze data is accountability and it can be a form of collective action. Especially in light of um, this report was released before all racial data was really being collected about COVID-19 deaths and disparities. Um, this was part of that push to really think about the racial ethnic gaps of the public health crisis that we're still living through. Moving on, um, uh, data reuse though, sometimes there's a subtype of data reuse in terms of uh, reusing data to keep powerful actors accountable. So the anti-eviction mapping project, for, for instance, um, one of their uh, founders, Aaron McElroy, writes in Property as Technology about how they often merge different data sets, such as LLC data, parcel ownership data, and eviction data to illuminate the corporate entities behind displacement within the Los Angeles context. Um, so in this quote in their other work, their broader work, they're really thinking about how do we reuse data sets to call attention to powerful actors, um, to show the connections between LLCs and parcel ownership and evictions, especially given the gentrification, urban displacement crisis, the housing affordability crisis in Los Angeles that disproportionately um, displaces and puts at risk communities of color. That were those same red and yellow zones that were disinvested in the 1920s and 1930s, right? As another example of, or as an example of data refusal, um, oftentimes I'm thinking about what in the paper, I'm thinking about data refusal as a way to bring public awareness and education to issues. Um, so Data for Black Lives, again, has this graphic in their report, one of their reports about abolition, which is a great report. And if you wanna think more about the racialized history of databases, they connect um, slave ships and slave inventory databases to thinking about how racialized histories of data matter. Um, but in the same report, they're also thinking about how the inputs 
and the outputs of the data? Um, why should we resist surveillance? Uh, why should we re resist risk ratios, credit scores that often penalize Black communities um, in the name of data? Another example of data refusal as a political strategy is from Our Data Bodies, which is a partner project between Stop LAPD spying and others, academics. Um, but they really show how data can be a political strategy, right? They wanted to shift who gets to find problems around data collection, data privacy, and data security from the elites to impacted communities. They want to shine a light on how communities have been confronting data-driven problems as well as how to confront these problems and to forge an analysis of data and data-driven technologies from and within allied struggles. Um, I include this last example of uh, data production just to show that while the standard research reports data sets is also included, uh, Mihente often thinks about how do you do it in a creative output, in a visual output to engage with their audiences. Um, so, I mean, all that to say, this paper just really sets the scene for the next project. Um, I'm more than happy to think about the typology more with you, but thinking about those themes of data use, data reuse, especially reuse to keep uh, powerful actors accountable, um, is underlying the second project that I'll dig into now. Oh, sorry, this last slide, just to think about underlying that project that sets the scene, is really thinking about the smart city stakeholder network. How do we move beyond um, just corporate and government actors involved in the process? How do we really democratize and involve the community, um, thinking about community organization, organizations and residents as part of the process and as experts in these decisions? Okay. So the next study, um, I'm gonna fast forward a little bit and hopefully you'll all be able to get what's going on, but um, I really look forward to the Q and A. Um, so this second study is just debunking or deconstructing uh, a novel in the urban indicator. So as background, I'm again thinking about how do we reuse data um, for different campaigns, for different issues, different questions about justice. How can data from commercial platforms actually be put to use for justice? Can they be engaged with community outcomes? Um, and what are the racial politics of data use and reuse? So to begin, I include this quote from Glaser et al. Um, I just include it to think because it sets the scene for this project as well, this study that um, Glaser et al, their team, um, Luke, I think Luca was also involved, they collected a lot of Yelp data. And so I'll be talking about how to use Yelp data for non-commercial ends. But in their piece, in their project, they were thinking about Yelp as an inherently value added data set, a data platform, right? So they said data from platforms like Yelp with official government statistics. They can be reused, repurposed, combined for positive outcomes. And so within this piece and other pieces, actually um, they show that Yelp actually is uh, helpful. It's often an accurate predictor for gentrification of communities. Um, and so within this project, I'm actually contesting is gentrification good for everyone? Um, how do we actually think about the commercial politics, the commercial platform, the commercial processes that underpin these platforms that skew these user bases, right? So um, thinking about gentrification, um, a lot of organizing in the communities in Los Angeles that are targeting these communities of color uh, that were previously disinvested. How do we actually think about how gentrification is not always positive? It has, it has violent ramifications um, upon these communities. Um, not everybody wants gentrification in their neighborhoods. And how do we think about the politics of data as it's implicated in such issues? And so I use the Yelp database um, with the city of LA's displacement pressure index and their LA indicator of neighborhood change, as well as a UCLA, UC Berkeley displacement project gentrification index to map and construct a data indicator um, just in, effort, in an effort to really replicate the key the sense, the, um, the broader findings of Glaser et al. and other studies. But um, as we'll unpack in the second part of this study, I unpack how these data sets, these quantitative modes of thinking often flatten, often diminish various contestations, different political relations within communities and ways in which um, different members of the community are trying to rise up or resist gentrification even, right? So 
Um, one way to spin the study or to think about it is how is Yelp a gentrifier platform? So thinking about skewed user databases, thinking about who might be well represented as well as not well represented within the platform. How do we think about the findings that and the data indicator, um, what it's helpful for, but what it's not helpful for? And so um, I combine these data sets. I also have GIS training um, and I coded each. Uh, or so to take one step back too, it's the from Yelp, I called coffee shops in Los Angeles. So I, I computationally just grabbed them through the API, grab coffee shops, their review count, their star ratings, um, but also categorize them based on artisanal or not artisanal. Um, mainly using an RA uh, research assistant, we coded for the artisanal coffee shops. You kind of know it when you don't because our inner coder reliability was actually like really high, like 96%, I believe. Um, but it's that coffee shop that has a mill aesthetic that has the single origin coffees, the special coffee options in Los Angeles. If you know anything about the area, um, it's horchata lattes are a very uh, helpful predictor, accurate uh, indicator. But thinking about these coffee shops and the landscape of coffee shops in Los Angeles, um, I was just playing, toying with and experimenting with the data to see if they might mimic these results from Glacier at all, Luca, McKinsey, Papa Christos. And, um, Generally, they do. Um, generally, a lot of the coffee shops tend to agglomerate within downtown, within highly gentrifying areas. You see that on the right in that red zone, the orange zone is also gentrifying. Um, but you also see that these coffee shops tend to be more visible as using review counts as a proxy. Um, thinking about how the most gentrifying neighborhoods often have the most highly reviewed coffee shops, um, et cetera. So I'll give you a couple moments to look at that map and then I'll go to the next one. But again, um, this, this first part of the study is just thinking about how do we use Yelp commercial data to map, to counter map um, the financialization of the real estate industry? How do we actually call into question how Yelp might be connected to the real estate industry and perpetuating gentrification? as it makes more visible these areas, these highly gentrifying areas, um, as evidenced by the number of coffee shops, as evidenced by the higher review counts in these, for these coffee shops in gentrifying areas. So that this next map is just the number of coffee shops per census tract. Um, you're seeing different maps and different, uh, different disaggregations due to the limitations of the data, open data sets that I was using. Um, some of them were census tracts, some of them that were overlaid were um, zip code. So that's also part of it. And then this, finally, this one is just, again, the review counts, um, just showing there are more review counts for these coffee shops in gentrifying areas. Um, what does that mean that uh, this replicates often that Yelp, Yelp can be a valid or accurate um, data source for predicting gentrification. And that box is just showing the downtown Los Angeles area. Um, I could go into more nuance and context Los Angeles as well, but um, downtown is just, as we think about urbanization, the push to go to the urban core, downtown LA is experiencing a revitalization and a push to be really that next uh, area where urban amenities are. Okay, so I've presented just kind of briefly mapped that data, but let's, let's deconstruct that data set. Um, let's kind of unpack and think about briefly um, but also within the Q&A, how the data set is skewed, what are the implications of that, how we put it to use uh, or not put it to use. So within this project, um, I center the second part, which is more qualitative, deconstructive analysis, um, thinking about the Yelp reviews for Weird Wave Coffee. So on the map, you'll see Weird Wave is the orange uh, star. And again, that downtown Los Angeles area is that red, the green zones, um, highly gentrifying, and Boyle Heights is often viewed as one of those next frontiers or is one of the next frontiers for gentrification. And in resistance, a lot of community organizations have actually called attention, uh, such as LA Tennis Union, La Vicina, uh, which um, has actually called attention to a specific coffee shop. So um, within the second part of the study, I'm just deconstructing, analyzing thematically what type of narratives are embedded within the reviews for this specific coffee shop. Um, and how do we think about and extrapolate um, how is Yelp a platform 
that is maybe skewed, not representative of community interests, or maybe limited. Um, maybe also, how is it depoliticizing a lot of the work and a lot of the activism that's there? And so I conducted a thematic analysis of, uh, within the study, just like 40 reviews for this coffee shop in particular, qualitative, um, in-depth thematic analysis. But I just share this first review and then we can get to Q&A uh, to kind of hint at the more extreme end of views, but also the extreme language that puts plainly um, kind of the review or the, the types of viewpoints that are diminished as well as the types of viewpoints that are upheld maybe within Yelp or that don't get moderated. Um, for instance, in this coffee shop review, um, you'll see the, the yellow highlights, which are actually re referencing what actually talks about the, the coffee shop or the coffee itself. Meanwhile, that white part of the review, and we'll unpack it and I'll read brief snippets. Um, but a lot of these reviews sometimes insert personal opinion, personal narrative as part of the as part of the review, yet sometimes these reviews get uh, morphed into tirades about a neighborhood, about a community. And so we can't really think about all of Yelp's data, all of Yelp's reviews as neutral. Um, we really have to question and nuance that and think about how might they be deploying racist tropes, um, right? As this um, reviewer says, I know this review is a bit off subject, but Weird Wave is bold in taking such a chance. Would it kill people to open a book or two when, when communities offer positive change, negatives on drugs, gangs, violence, they thrive. I celebrate diversity, but I do not show prejudice towards anyone of any color to build a small business anywhere. So what this review snippet is showing is just really thinking about how this coffee shop, Boyle Heights, is a predominantly Latinx community. Um, there's a lot of activism against gentrification, yet this reviewer is just calling attention to these racist tropes of the community as violent, as um, heavy, uh, heavy activity for gangs, drugs, and violence, um, which is actually not with the current trends of LA city at, at the time of this project. Um, but they also deploy like kind of this colorblind diversity narrative of like, oh, I celebrate diversity, but I don't want to be prejudiced against like the one of the owners is white, one of the owners is actually Latinx. And so we can think about how to complicate those narratives and the implications as well. Um, it gets better though. Because in the second snippet of this review, um, the same reviewer says, I hope not, or do not mistake, I always carry a weapon, or I always carry, assumingly, a weapon or a gun um, in this instance, but I hope not to need this skill when shopping for a freaking cup of coffee. And it would be in the best interest of such a neighborhood to make people outside the community feel welcome if you want to thrive. Um, so in this, in this part of the review, we see how this reviewer um, justifies the loss of life, um, the diminishes the, the claims of activists that are resisting gentrification and saying, oh, like I am more than willing to escalate to violence um, to, to have my right to get coffee at this shop. And so within the study, and I can dig into it a little more, but I'm just thinking about what's in a Yelp review. Um, are all reviews actually, how do we actually think about and scrutinize how racist tropes, violent language is often deployed um, used to diminish activism, used to diminish gentrification. Um, what are the politics and how do we think about broader scopes of data, data sources as we fight for justice, as we fight for equity? Um, yes. And so all that to say, and I look forward to the Q&A, but um, just circling back to that original question of uh, thinking about if urban big and open data is the answer, what is the question? Um, how do we really think about the skewed user bases, the skewed data sets, the political, their political nature, how they've been weaponized, their histories, their legacies? Um, and how does a more grounded, more community engaged approach um, foster racially just outcomes? How can urban data be used, reused, and refused to ensure racial justice? Thank you. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Matt for this great talk. And thank you everybody for your questions. We're going to give you a chance for more questions to come in. Um, and uh, we will be great. We're on the screen. Um, just use your chat, your sorry, the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. And um, we will, you can vote on questions, you can upvote questions, and we'll try to get to as many of those as possible. 
Um, so Matt, thanks. This is really a fantastic yeah. talk and it's great to see how your work is, is, um, is going and, and evolving and, and developing. I um, really loved this idea um, of your kind of unique um, position of bringing together critical um, theories of critical race, so critical race theory and data science. These are probably two polar opposites of methodologies and epistemologies of how, mm -hmm. how, how we be in academic settings. And so I would love for you to, to do two things. One really um, highlight, come back to why is it important that we bring um, critical theory together with data science? And then second, maybe talk a little bit about your own transformation in that process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, and I forgot to actually highlight it in the beginning of the, the presentation, but I started my PhD, so I went to LSE, got a, PhD, a few PhD offers, decided to go to USC because they think the nexus of being around uh, immigrant communities and thinking about immigrant justice, um, they were doing a lot of cool things about digital inequalities. Um, and so I think I came up, like I was trained in statistics and I was like, oh, I'm going to get more computational training, do data science for good. Um, and so that was the initial idea for the dissertation. And then being in boardrooms where I was actually a data science fellow at a local agency um, where engineers are like, hey, we just need all of Google's data. That's how we'll address our community's problems. Um, and not really thinking about those critical ethical issues that I had um, started to engage with. Uh, I don't know if I fully dug into it until like that year when I was like, oh no, like this is actually the, the type of rhetoric and this is what's being taught. How do we question actually, why do, why do we look to Google for data? Do we really need all of Google's data? Um, so I think that kind of was like a reflexive moment where a lot of my, I think it was a turning point, right? I think the dissertation initially was gonna be, oh, like we're just gonna find some data set, do some computational modeling and then address a persistent problem. But really digging into the literature about critical race theory, about how data has been just weaponized against communities of color. Um, so like the Moynihan report, but other instances of saying, oh, the data says this. Um, but actually, do we ever question, do we really scrutinize the gaps in data, um, how data analysis is put to work? And so that led to just thinking about critical race theory. Um, I mean, I to be, to be honest, like background is also the Yelp data. I scraped it for a class. Like I had to learn how to like scrape. And so I was like, okay, like what's a fun platform? And like, I think the That's coffee it. shop idea initially started of like, hey, I'm actually a frequenter of these coffee shops that I'm critiquing. And as like, we think about them as symbols of artisanal coffee shops as symbols of gentrification. It's like, oh, am I like implicitly involved in this process that's displacing these communities, often immigrant communities. Um, I think there's a complex layer and like for the sake of brevity, <laughs> I didn't really go into it, but LA is also complicated in that a lot of the gentrification is like sometimes called hentification because mm -hmm. it's this second generation, this middle-class educated, um, more elite uh, immigrant mm -hmm. community that's displacing the first generation. And so I think there's really cool work that's questioning, is that the same gentrification as like the traditional modes that we think about of white communities displacing communities of color? But I think that that first Yelp project just really started as like, oh, like, am I implicated? How do I scrutinize? How do I hold data to think about those complex questions? And the politics of these platforms that we're increasingly relying on for data analysis. Mm -hmm. um, so like data is a new oil, data is a new gold, whatever metaphor you use, but actually is it valuable? What is it valuable for? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, and, and, so. and uh, valuable for asking which questions and who mm -hmm. frames those questions, right? And I think that's something that's yeah. really powerful about um, the work you've presented tonight is right. um, you, you know, being able to sit on both sides mm -hmm. of both um, somebody yeah. who had to be in a class and, and learn to scrape data. And we teach that here at the Oxford Internet Institute. Um, you know, we go to the platforms <laughs> yeah. where the API makes it easy. And that mm -hmm. means that some platforms are better well studied than others. And that means that these consumer facing sites are the ones that students know about and we get the data and, yeah. and et cetera. Uh, but then, you know, who, who gets to ask questions of these, of these mm -hmm. data and, and who gets yeah. to, to do that? And I think that's something that's really powerful about the tension in your work because, you know, on the one mm -hmm. hand, um, 
we can we can talk about challenging um, data power, but you also mm -hmm. want to be able to hold on to the concept that data is power. Yeah, and I think I mean uh, I think we initially actually talked about this, but um, do you know one of your articles about critique and contribute, right? So I think a lot of times critical race theory. And as somebody trained in data science, I was like, uh, I don't know how somebody's going to use this of like, mm -hmm. oh, like data is not good, right? So thinking about the nuances, the complexities, and I think I center those community organizations because a lot of them are aware of these politics that, yes, you can critique data, you can refuse data, but a lot of the ways in which data is like a persuasion tool, is a persuasive tool for policy. How do you get the data that you need? How do you do the data analysis that you need to compel these um, policymakers to actually believe in your case because mm -hmm. i think and, the, and i think that's another thing that i would love data scientists such as myself and others that to continue to think about is like what's the what are you actually proving from your analytics your com complex computation models that people on the ground don't already know mm -hmm. right so mm -hmm. i think the analysis the deconstruction of the yelp reviews and other things is like yes we know gentrification is happening we know like coffee shops they might not be causing it, but they are a symbol of there's impending neighborhood change. So like, what's what's the value added of what you're doing? Mm -hmm. uh, so I constantly think about that of like, what am I actually doing? What am I actually showing that mm -hmm. other communities, community advocates don't actually already know? Yeah. Or how do we work with them to ask the questions? Mm -hmm. I mean, I uh, I know that's yeah. kind of where you're you're going yeah. next in your work, but you know, bringing um, tools of analysis into communities and helping people think about how they might collect mm -hmm. data. I mean, we, we talk about this a little yep. bit in the self-tracking book of, you know, many of these tools and platforms are not designed to help people answer the next question. They're help, they're designed to answer one specific question that, that the, that the yeah. designers had in mind. And mm -hmm. sure, the data, data are there, but then you know, how do they get reused, repurposed, um, particularly in ways that are emancipatory? And I think, yeah, that's like, I think that's the myth of like open data, right? Like, oh, like we will, um, City of LA, I love them. They're trying to be a leader, but also who's engaging with this data set? Who's engaging with the data? Who's actually using it? Who has access to it? And so I think COVID-19 was a flashpoint because actually a lot of people, and I already knew it because I was, I do digital divides work or digital inequalities as well. But I think a lot of people were like, actually, like digital access is still a persistent issue. And so if people can't even get access to the internet, mm -hmm. how are they gonna have access to internet data driven data sources to have the complex to navigate the complexities? I think I don't wanna diminish a lot of the really creative and complex engaging work from community organizations. And to like, I think, yeah, anyways, all that to say of like, I think we have to think about them as assets and not as deficient resources, but also how are persistent inequalities still present and mm -hmm. limiting how data can be put to work. Um, yeah, definitely. So. so I just, before we turn into questions, there's questions pouring in. We've had over a hundred people on the call tonight with us. So we have a big audience. I want to give a, um, a shout out to my dear old friend, um, um, George Kolombatovich, who is the special counsel to Mayor Eric Garcetti, um, mayor of Los Angeles was able to join us and he just says he passes on um, it's really fascinating and speaking from the perspective of my work a critically important presentation so so um, thank you waiting just to just to give you kind of the feedback that's coming um, so many people are really excited about this so I'm going to turn to the questions mm -hmm. um, first from Nia Gupta um, and I'm going to shorten them a little bit just in time um, so urban data justice is really intriguing in times of a global health pandemic, uh, we have to think about these figures of death and now vaccinations and cases. Mm -hmm. How do you think, how do you think justice in data would be delivered by governments in various economies around the world? What do we need to be doing now in, mm -hmm. in COVID times? Yeah, I mean, I think I've been thinking about this question. Um, I think thinking about the smart city imaginary, I think how I've been thinking about it is very North American, European um, versus I think I've been thinking about how South, South Asia has a different response to the government's collection of data or mm -hmm. purposing of data. And so I think Neha, like your question is like really, I think it's important. And I think it's thinking about the complexities and nuances in different contexts. Um, I really love a lot of the data active work and um, a lot of the data justice labs work 
Um, I think Stefania Milan is talking about um, big data from the South, right? And how do we think about the marginality of people and their position? So I'm using that approach to think about, uh, to contest what they call data universalism. Um, so thinking about like data is not universal, it's not the same in all contexts. How do we think about those complexities? Those, And also how do we reframe and contest the North American dominance or European dominance of how we think about data and mm -hmm. government collection of data? So that is definitely, I have thoughts still to be formed. Yeah, it's it's certainly we're entering a new, I think a new stage in the relationship of um, people to states with vis-a-vis -vis particularly personal data in, in, mm -hmm. in COVID and post COVID times. The next question comes from um, Jeff Hing. Many platforms like Yelp and Zillow use data elements that come from public administrative data, property assessments, sales, business licenses. What are the considerations around thinking of data as a public good rather than as raw material for commercial products that play a role in shaping these communities? What are the different mobilities with administrative data that publics have when compared to corporations? Mm -hmm. um... I mean, I think this one might be a little shorter too, but thinking about commercial data sets, I think they're often limited in access um, because of the APIs or the APIs terms of service. So we didn't get into it, but actually the Yelp study technically, and I didn't actually call the reviews, but they limit only three reviews per business that mm -hmm. you um, search. So unless I wanna potentially get sued, which is now protected by the ACLU lawsuit. Anyways, um, I didn't wanna get sued. So I think that the Yelp reviews that I collected were also the methods, the sources that I had to draw from were limited based on their terms of service. Um, so I think commercial data sets overall, I mean, Facebook, everybody wants access to the Facebook data maybe, but like they're very much gatekeepers in terms of who has access. So I think at least open government data sets have some sort of access available. But then I think about Florida and there was a data scientist that um, she was publishing COVID-19 numbers because they were they were missing some data. They were missing some data points, and how they actually stopped publishing or sharing a lot of those data sets. And so I think um, it's complicated, Jeff. It's complicated, <laughs> like many yeah. things we study. But I'll just say I think there's like, uh, and like we can dig into it later if time allows. But like think about the flexible, adaptive ways that we that I had to like. Okay, so I can grab this from Yelp to prove this case. What do I need to do with a more qualitative mode and like actually questioning. Um, if we don't have access to the data, what can we do? So is quantitative data always going to solve the problems or who actually has access to those? Um, oftentimes, sometimes, I mean, a couple of researchers have access to Yelp data because all of the Yelp data because of they're in business schools or like what they're saying versus mm -hmm. I don't think Yelp would give me all access to their data. Right. And so those power <laughs> imbalances, right, of, you know, which platforms get studied and um, you know, the ease of, of being able to get um, certain kinds of data make a difference, really, yeah. in, in what gets studied. Um, uh, next is a question from Nathaniel Henry, Henry, who says, wow, thanks for an excellent talk and fascinating deconstruction of Yelp reviews. He asks, I've noticed that many social media platforms have set up programs like Facebook's Data for Good and Microsoft's AI for Good that are aimed to position their data uncritically as a community input. Some of these programs have seen a lot of uptake during the pandemic. How do you think about the ethics of using, sorry, how do you think about the ethics of using the my yeah. Q and A thing scrolls when you all upvote, which is great, keep upvoting. Um, how do you think of the ethics of using those data sources in cases where there isn't a clear alternative? Yeah, I mean, I think, um... That's a great question. And I think thinking about uh, a lot of like, I think about data ethics more broadly, it's just having this larger conversation of, yes, data access from these corporate companies, big tech, but also can, can and should we receive funding for research? And I think those are very complicated. Like it's really complicated, it's a mess. Um, but I do think um, there is some use utility. And I think as an academic, I'm always curious to dig into the data to see what is available um, I haven't had really experience with any of Facebook's or Microsoft's data sets, but I think that is a good that is a great question. But also like keeping in mind the corporate interest too, and foregrounding that of a lot of the most preeminent researchers grab funding from the big tech, and that that's great. That's great for the research program. 
But I think in this moment, we can look also and critique thinking about Google's firing of their responsible AI team leads. And how does that get murky um, when you want to be really bring a critical light or shed critical issues? We have a question from Arik Chaudhuri, and it's a long question. I'm going to I'm going to skim through it. But um, in the UK, there is currently a really strong public policy narrative about vaccine hesitancy amongst the BAME, the Black, Asian and minority ethnic groups. And the data for this narrative is weak. Now there's some surveys and those surveys have a hand, just have handfuls of BAME respondents, but the bigger problem is the very broad data labels and categories used for the analysis like BAME, Black, Asian, and they're used and misused to describe common traits amongst non-white people. Now these labels can often be misconstrued to build negative or misleading narratives about people of color. Do you see a similar problem in the US and do you have a view on how to do better data collection, particularly around this question of data labels? Yeah, I mean, I think definitely the data labels question is an important question. Um, I mean, I think when I, Eric, when I saw your question, I was immediately thinking about this predatory visibility. So Ruha Benjamin talks about that of sometimes uh, data scientists say there's a gap in the data. So like we need to find more data, um, but actually that doesn't solve these pro persistent problems, right? So I'm thinking about how Google doesn't, didn't have enough black faces in their data sets. So what did they do? They try to take photos of black homeless people in San Francisco to supplement their inaccuracies. Um, so I, I think the data labels and the data gaps question are similar in that um, I really think we have to first take a step back of like, is there more data labeling that needs to be done? Or is it really the critical approaches, critical methods, the narrative, the analytical work that needs to be developed. Um, I mean, I am also thinking about in the US context how data disaggregation is also a big issue and especially within the Asian American community. Um, so I come from Vietnamese refugees. Our experiences are very different than the East Asian context, the East Asian experience, um, very different classes. And so I guess I, I think about the nuances that get lost, but also the sheer fact that a lot of times Asian, Asian American groupings aren't even always included in the data or at my previous institution, the diversity data for the graduate students often conflated national origins. So Asian and Asian American students were viewed as the same. Um, and so the complexities, the nuances that get lost in the midst of that, mm -hmm. but yeah, great question. We are almost out of time. I wanna remind all of you that we will have a follow-up email where, where um, Dr. Boy will summarize some of his key points. And he'll have the opportunity to take on some of the key questions we don't get the time to. I'm just, again, overwhelmed by the wonderful response that we've had. So in our remaining few minutes, I want to um, jump to a question slightly different from some of the others that we've um, asked, which is, um, what was your relationship with the community organizations in this mm -hmm. project? And how did you develop those relationships? And are there any principles mm -hmm. that you use to guide this relationship building? Yeah. So um, I think the brief end is that the content analysis was actually a COVID strategic um, decision in terms of like a lot of those organizations. I was a data science fellow at one. So we had hosted a lot of community town halls. Um, I'm actively involved with the anti-eviction mapping project and a couple of their COVID related projects. And a lot of my colleagues are the spearheaders of those. Um, I've been on panels with Data for Black Lives and Mijente representatives. So I think, throughout that initial stage, like three years ago, being a data science fellow to now those three years, I've been engaged with a lot of these communities, um, organizations and thinking about them or like observing a lot of these university-based projects. Um, and I think a lot of really thinking about how do we continue to foreground this lens of data justice versus data ethics is really important in these conversations. Mm -hmm. And I love that it's continued to evolve, but I think, um, there's also this question of the ethics washing uh, of the of the scene as um, corporate interests, as like not the community input, like who are we really foregrounding? Um, I think now we know it's an issue. Inequalities, racial inequalities are an issue. Hope, um, if you haven't realized that by now, hopefully you have. Uh, but I think it's how do we press that conversation even further to be more complex, to be more engaged with, oh, where do we go from here? Um, and ethics washing is not gonna solve it. How do we really foreground justice? How do we really think about the complex nuanced ways 
of how Black, Indigenous, people of color, those communities actually experience it all differently as well. Um, and so, yeah. And I think um, underlying also, if it's helpful foreground, I'm also thinking about the my Asianness and the Asian Americanness origins. And so thinking about, oh, a lot of like people, like a lot of people, a lot of the leaders in tech are Asian men as well. Right. And just how do we think about those complexities, those racialized histories and complicate that? So I think, how do we actually think about um, the anti-Blackness within the Asian American community sometimes and how that infiltrates data science? Um, so I'm, that's some preview of things I'm working on, but yeah. In our last 60 seconds, <laughs> we turn it back over to our events team. First, I wanna thank all of you for having come and um, uh, apologies that we can't get to the many, many great questions here. Um, what advice would you have for uh, the graduate students who might be listening on this call? Um, to the grad students, I feel for you. I'm still navigating the precarity in a little bit, uh, in a little ways. Um, but I think definitely one, take care of yourselves. Two, know that, um, follow your gut. I think a lot of times this project in its different stages, it's been more, it's well formed now, maybe we can critique it in different ways. Um, but a lot of the early feedback I got uh, was really critical. And so I think, like for instance, I got a comment that there's no there there. Like we already know racist algorithms exist. The book is written. Like how does your project advance that? But I think that those critiques, one, they're very personal and very sensitive. So I was like, oh, like I hate that type of feedback. But two, I think they pushed me to really um, know why I do what I do and to really not, to not take uh, for granted that I can do this um, and why I do the work that I do. And, in the midst of the haters, it's just how to roll it off the shoulders, right? Um, in the midst of those critiques, how to really engage with them for what they're worth, but also not always fully engage with them if they're not helpful. So I think there will always be critiques, just follow your gut. Um, as well as make really great friends with your cohort mates and your peers, because they'll be the ones that get you along through this process, as well as great mentors, dissertation auntie, but also I think <laughs> peer support is very imp important. It's yeah. it's. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure having been your dissertation auntie. Um, yeah. So on that cheery note, I'll bring our events team back on. I want to thank all of you for joining us uh, today and thank Dr. Matthew Bowie for being uh, our guest tonight and get delivering such a fascinating talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Matthew and Gina. That was, um, as we said, very fascinating. And um, we thank everyone for attending as well. And as Gina mentioned, you will receive a follow-up email in due course with uh, some of the points mentioned today um, and sort of a, a summary of, of maps of key takeaways. So um, for our next Wednesday webinar, which is happening next week, um, we have the wonderful Professor Victoria Nash hosting Elizabeth Denham, the UK Information Commissioner. And she'll be dis uh, discussing from facial recognition technology to children online, regulating data protection in 2021. And that's at the 3rd of March at 1 p.m. UK time. So please do a visit the events page on the OII website to sign up for that talk. Uh, thank you again all for attending and have a wonderful day, evening, morning, night, wherever you are in the world. And thank you. <laughs>